God, I do thank you that you are a God of glory. You are also a God of mercy and grace and goodness and love. Lord, I, I love that illustration when, as they, the girls were sharing, asked what crucifixion is and someone said, Jesus loves me. What could be better than that? And I pray that that would be something that we would all perhaps understand and even apply in a new way into our lives. Would you help us now as we come to your word? God, I think that there is such a clear message for us from the book of Nehemiah. Help us to understand it. Help us to apply it. And God, I pray that you would help us to truly stay faithful to you because you are faithful to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we saw last Sunday, the immense building project, the walls of Jerusalem, were finally completed. In fact, I'm hoping that you are already in Deuteronomy. I'm hoping that maybe your Bibles are even starting to fall open to Deuteronomy because we've been in it for a while. I want you to be in Deuteronomy 6. Yeah, what? Nehemiah, let's go to Nehemiah. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> so let's, can we, is it too late to start over? No, okay. Nehemiah, I want you to be in Nehemiah chapter six. <laughs> and I want to read a few verses. These are ones we went through last week. And I want to just kind of remind uh, ourselves of what we saw in regards to that. So Nehemiah chapter six, verses 15 and 16. If you would follow along as I read those. So, the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Alal, in 52 days. And when all of our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. What a great two verses there, and, and the things that God allowed to be done. In fact, again, we talked about this, but the project done in just 52 days, that was such a monumental, almost miraculous accomplishment that even the enemies, even the surrounding nations felt that it must have been the God of Nehemiah who allowed this to happen and to be completed and to be finished so rapidly. So as we talked about then, God was so glorified in this. Not only was he glorified by the seemingly miraculous completion of the project, but then God even went further with it and he caused those brash, hubristic, uh, prideful, self-confident enemies of the Jewish people to be afraid. We read that, and I don't know about you, but I read that and I think, wow, finally now, Nehemiah can relax because we have seen the opposition to him and to this building project throughout the entire book of Nehemiah, not Deuteronomy, Nehemiah. We have seen it over and over again, these men opposing him, doing everything they can to stop it. So finally I'm thinking, oh, Nehemiah can take a breath. He can relax. Finally the people of Jerusalem doing all of this work, forsaking even their own planting of crops, and we talked about some of those things before, but all that they had gone through, finally now they could relax, knowing that there was nothing more that their enemies could do to oppose them. Or so at least we would hope. But let's keep reading. Nehemiah chapter 6, let's look at verses 17 through 19. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. And Tobiah's letters came to them, for many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara. And his son, Johananan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Wait, what? What in the world is going on here? The walls were done. The enemies were afraid. They even had to attribute this to the work of God. Wouldn't you think that finally these enemies would throw in the towel? You would think that finally they would admit that they were defeated. They were unable to keep this construction project from going forth and they, they failed in their attempt to stop the built, rebuilding of the walls. 
But yet we see here that Tobiah, one of Nehemiah's main three enemies, was still trying to cause trouble. It's just incredible. You see, even though it was forbidden for Jews to intermarry with people from other nations, evidently, Tobiah, who was an Ammonite, had married into a Jewish family. And not only that, but his son Jehoanan did the very same thing. And so these family ties here gave Tobiah much more influence and power over the Jewish community than he should have ever had. The spies. <laughs> they were reporting back to Tobiah everything that Nehemiah said. And then these people also, because of these alliances that they had with him, which were forbidden by God, but because of these unholy alliances, then they were also trying to uh, convince Nehemiah what a good guy Tobiah was. <laughs> it's like, give me a break. Tobiah is a terrible man, and we have seen throughout this book over and over again, him and Sanballat and Geshem, how they have always opposed him. In fact, again, look at the end of verse 19, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. We just read that he was afraid, all the other enemies were afraid, but yet he's still persisting and trying now to make Nehemiah also be afraid. So why? Why after the walls were done? Why after the task was completed? Did Tobiah still try to work against Nehemiah and to frighten him? And I think that it's because Tobiah understood something that made him very dangerous at this point in time. And I think he understood something that made Nehemiah very vulnerable at this point in time. You see, there, there's a phenomenon, phenomenon in sports. It's, it's known as a throwaway game. And so what you see happen sometimes is a team will play a better team, a superior team, and they will just play the game of their lives and they will beat this better team. But then the next week, they are playing a team that is not nearly as good as they are. And what you will often see happen is they will lose to the weaker opponent. And it's because what happened is they let their guard down. They played so intensely against this better team that then the next week they were overconfident and they thought, whew, we don't even have to worry about this one and they end up being defeated. Well, I think that that concept far supersedes sports. It goes on in many areas of life. Because you see, we are often most vulnerable after a great success. And so we must be careful to never let our guard down. You see, that's why I believe that Tobiah was still at it. He understood that. He knew that Nehemiah was potentially more vulnerable after, after the uh, completion of the walls than he had been even during the project itself. In fact, just let me show you some, Bible, some examples of this from the Bible. So we're going we're gonna to be back here to Nehemiah. Well, what I want you to do is, I want you right now with, to go with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18. We were there last week. We were looking at Elijah and the great victory that he had over the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And you think about that with me. It had to have been one of the most incredible days of Elijah's life. First, if you remember right, he had prayed and God had sent down fire to whoosh, consume his sacrifice that had been totally doused and saturated with water. Then he had had the 450 false prophets, these prophets of Baal, killed. But he still wasn't done because remember there had also been this severe three-year drought going on. And so, Neom, or, boy, Elijah not to be confused with anyone in Deuteronomy or Nehemiah, but Elijah, he continued his day, continued to be the servant of God, and so he prayed now. I want you to look at verse 45, verse 45 of 1 Kings 18. After all of this stuff has been going on, and he's praying now for the end of the drought, 45 of chapter 18 of 1 Kings and in a little while, the heavens grew black 
with clouds and wind and there was a great rain. But wait, he's still not done. There's even more. Let's, let's, let's keep reading here, picking up in the same verse. And Ahab, that's the wicked king, remember, Ahab rode and he went to Jezreel and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now we read that and we think, well, that's no real particular big deal. But yeah, it was a big deal. First of all, the rain is now coming. This rain that they haven't seen in three years, it's getting dark, it's getting black, the rain is coming. Ahab is in a chariot, by the way, which was drawn by horses, and they were trying to hurry to the city of Jezreel, which was 17 miles away. God supernaturally allowed Elijah to run ahead of horses pulling chariot for 17 miles. So I tell you what, he was on top of his game. That had to be one of the most incredible days of his entire life to do all of these miracles through the power of God. In fact, he saw so much of God's goodness, so much of God's greatness, so much of God's power that man, if we just stopped right there, I would I would bet that Elijah never gave in to fear or doubt again. Because look at all this stuff that he had just accomplished through the power of God. But let's keep reading. Chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab, remember he's the king, the wicked king, told Jezebel, that's his wife, who was even more wicked than he was. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and he sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die. Saying, is, is enough now, O Lord? Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. I'm confused. This man who had just defeated 450 prophets of Baal, a false god. This man who had just called down fire from heaven. This man who had just ended a three-year drought. This man who had just run 17 miles at a record speed was afraid of a woman who made threats against him. Now, no doubt, fatigue and, emotion, and an emotional letdown had to have played a part in his fear and depression. But I think that this illustrates our point. We are often most vulnerable after a great success, and so we must be careful to never let our guard down. Go with me to 2 Samuel. Book right before this. Go to 2 Samuel. I want you to go to chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. David was not only the giant killer, but he was also a man that God himself described as being a man after God's own heart. That's a pretty good referral. He was the greatest warrior king that Israel ever had, and in fighting, fighting in the power of God, he won victory after victory, defeating all of the nations around him. It was so good, in fact, that David didn't even have to go to battle with his troops anymore. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. I mean, come on, who could blame him? He had accomplished it all. He deserved to rest on his laurels. He, enjoyed, he, he deserved to just enjoy being a king and not being out there leading his troops into battle. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 2, it happened late one afternoon 
when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her. Now, she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. What a mess. But wait, that wasn't even the worst part. It gets t more bad or more worse. I was going to say more worse, but I don't think that's proper. It gets worse. Let's just say that. Okay. Because you know the story. To cover up his adultery, David ended up having Uriah murdered. What in the world is going on? David loved God so much that God said, here's a man who is after my own heart. David had had nothing but success after success after success as the king of Israel. How could this happen? And I'll tell you, it's because David let his guard down. He thought he was safe. He thought he was secure. But I tell you again, we are often most vulnerable after a great success. And so we must be careful to never let our guard down. What? You're, you're still not convinced? Okay, let's, let's, let me give you one more example. Someone maybe not quite as commonly known, but I want you to turn now to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings 18, when he was just 25 years old, Hezekiah became the king of Judah, which was after David's son Solomon was the king, then uh, the, the 12 tribes split apart. And the two southern tribes uh, became known as Judah. He was their king. He was a very godly man, and, he, and God had given him great success. 2 Kings 18, go down to verse 5 with me, please. Speaking of Hezekiah here, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Whatever, or excuse me, wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and his territory from Watchtower to fortified city. <laughs> now, six years into his reign, then, the ten northern tribes of Israel, after they had split, they were defeated and taken captive uh, by Assyria, who is just mentioned here in this passage. Sy Assyria was the dominant power in the world at that time. And so, sure enough, a few years later, they came knocking on the door of Judah. And they weren't knocking, asking for a, to borrow a cup of sugar. They were knocking on the door, the gates of the city, because they were there to conquer them. So Hezekiah prayed. He prayed, and God struck down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And he saved Judah from being conquered by Assyria. Well, a little while later after that, Hezekiah became sick. He came, became very sick. In fact, he was almost dying. And so what he did then is he prayed. And again, God healed him. God did a miracle again, and he healed him. And God also uh, promised him them 15 more years of life, allowing him to be the king. And in fact, just to prove that to Hezekiah, God allowed the sundial to go back 10 steps to reverse the sun there for that, just to prove to Hezekiah that he was going to give him those 15 more years. Hezekiah was a man who trusted God. He was a man who loved God. He was a man who served God. He was a man who led his people to follow after God. And man, oh man, because of his love for God and his obedience to him, I'll tell you, his life was good. Very good. But you can't ever let your guard down. Go over a couple more chapters with me to 2 Kings 20. 2 Kings 20. I want you to go down to verse 12 with me. Let me read a few verses as you follow along. 2 Kings 20, beginning in verse 12. 
At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah welcomed them, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. And then Isaiah, the prophet, came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say? And from where did they come to you? And Hezekiah said, they have been from a far country, uh, from Babylon. He said, well, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up and up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and some of your own sons who shall be born to you shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Man, he let his guard down. And the sin of pride, the sin of pride reared its ugly head when he least expected it. And so then these this envoy comes from Babylon and he shows them everything that God has given him and his kingdom. And he did it because of pride. And I'll tell you, Hezekiah stumbled because he let his guard down. I tell you, we are never truly safe from temptations, especially when, the things, when things are going really well for us. So I say again to you, we are often most vulnerable after a great success. And so we must be careful to never let our guard down. Well, thankfully, Nehemiah understood that. He stayed on high alert, even though Tobiah now was trying to still work against him. Nehemiah stayed on high alert, and he did not let Tobiah gain any advantage over him at all. In fact, he even stepped up his game. I tell you, I love this man, Nehemiah. Let's go back to his book, the book that he wrote there. Go back to Nehemiah chapter 7 now with me. Chapter 7. Because Nehemiah did two very important, two very intelligent things because he understood what was at stake here. Nehemiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Now when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. I love Nehemiah. He's so brilliant, and he knew he could not let his guard down. So first of all, he delegated responsibility to godly, trustworthy men. Now, we've met Hanani before. We met him way back in chapter 1. He is not only a brother of Nehemiah, but he was also one of the people who first came to Nehemiah and told him about the state of the walls of Jerusalem being all destroyed there. But the thing that was really significant about him, the thing that was so important, is that he was a man of integrity. I tell you, character, godly character matters. It's important what we do and how we do that. And because of the fact that he was a godly man, he was now rewarded and put into this prominent position. He, along with Hananiah, they were promoted to really take charge over the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah stepped it up by putting godly men in uh, these responsible positions. The second thing he did is Nehemiah set up rules to protect the people and the city. Let's keep reading here now in verse 3. And I said to them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard post and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. This was so brilliant what he did. You see, normally the gates of a city were opened very early, right at dawn, so that the merchants and various people could come into the city and they could sell their goods and they could trade with the people and do whatever they needed to do in regards to that. The problem is, early in the morning is when the city is also very vulnerable. People haven't had their coffee yet and they're still kind of, <laughs> some of them are still in bed and they're just kind of, they're not on high alert. 
so what Nehemiah did is he refused to let the wall, excuse me, the, the gates of the city be opened at the normal time. He would not allow it until later in the morning when it was hot. Then they could come in and then also he would make them shut down the city gates at a much earlier hour. He did all of this to protect the people of Jerusalem from surprise attacks before the city was up and awake or once the people had kind of settled into their homes in the evening. I love the fact that Nehemiah realized that he and the people of Jerusalem were potentially vulnerable after their great success. And so he refused to let down his guard. He refused to just coast along. He refused to think that the danger was all behind them. Think about this with me. Maybe you, too, have had some great successes. But I think that that often puts you in a very vulnerable, very vulnerable position. Maybe, for example, maybe, maybe you and your, your spouse, your husband or wife, you went through some really hard times in your marriage. But you know what? You, you, were, you refused to give in and so you, you worked hard together, you persevered, you drew closer to God, you built your family home more upon godly principles and you made it better, you made your marriage better than it ever was before. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, it's like the bottom just falls out and you are left wondering if your marriage is even going to survive. Or maybe you struggled with something else. Maybe you struggled with gossip. Oh my goodness. You knew it was wrong. And so you memorized verses about it. You prayed. You worked so hard to control what you said. And then it seemed like finally, after so long, and with God's help, you were able to conquer and control your tongue. And then, bam! Bam! just out of nowhere. It's like, man, maybe you've gone months or even years and you'd never really fallen into that sin anymore and then out of nowhere you just you start doing it. And you know what? You kind of liked it. And you, all of a sudden you're right back into that trap again. Or maybe you struggled with anger and bitterness. Man, you had, that consumed you for years. And you pleaded with God and you worked so hard to forgive and you were doing so well. You feel like you finally broke free from the shackles of the bondage of those sins. And then out of nowhere, you started remembering and you started thinking about the past. And the next thing you know, you're consumed with anger and bitterness again. Those negative thoughts and emotions that you thought were so far behind you are right there in front of you. Maybe you struggled with lust and even pornography. My goodness, you hated yourself for it, so you confessed it and you prayed regularly. You started guarding your eyes. Maybe you even had an accountability partner. And then finally, you just broke free of the bondage. You weren't tempted every single day with this and you f it felt so good and you were so, so relieved to be free of the burden of all of that. And so a few years go by maybe even and then... One day, you just innocently stumble across something on the internet. And suddenly, you find yourself being sucked right back into it again. Maybe you struggle with greed or, or selfishness or, or pride or fear or worry or envy or any other number of sins that we could list here. And you committed yourself to God. You took the steps to break free. You relied on the power of Jesus Christ, the same power that raised him from the dead. You relied on that power every single day so that you could overcome that sin. And by doing that, you were finally able to break free. You were finally able to put that sin behind you. And then months or even years later, you are unexpectedly tripped up by that same sin again. What happened? Well, I think that there are at least two things at play here. Two things that we must always be mindful of. A, you can never stop trusting and relying on God for help because you think you can handle on your own. 
You see, every day when you were struggling with the sin originally, every day you prayed, every day you depended upon God. You woke up in the morning, you were afraid to get out of bed without committing your day to God and asking him to strengthen you and to guard you from that sin. And so God protected you. But after a while, the sense of urgency, the sense of danger, it's gone. And you don't feel that threatened by it. And so what you start to do, you don't even... You don't even acknowledge this. You don't say it to God. You're not consciously aware of it. But we're basically, we're like, okay, God, thank you for the help. Thank you for getting me through those tough months and years. But I think I've got it now. I think I'm safe. It's behind me. But unbeknownst to you, there was still a small spark smoldering way down in the embers of your past, just waiting for you to let down your guard. Second thing that's at play here is this. Your enemy, Satan, knows where you are weak, and he is an expert at waiting until just the right time to attack you again. So don't think for one second that Satan gave up just because you were victorious for a few months or maybe even a few years. It could even be a few decades. Don't think that he has given up. Don't think that because you have not stumbled, the battle is, it's never going to happen again. I tell you, our enemy, he is very patient and he is very diligent and he would love nothing more than to catch you by surprise when finally you let your guard down. Because remember, we are often most vulnerable after a great success. And so we must be careful to never let our guard down. You see, Nehemiah understood that. And because of that, he protected himself and he protected the people of Jerusalem. And I pray that you and I will also understand that. I pray that you and I will be committed anew to not letting our guard down ever. And that we will never, ever stop relying upon God every day of our lives to overcome and to protect us. Just because we had victory in the past does not assure us a victory in the future. I say to you, out of the most love that I can possibly have to you, do not let your guard down. You're not that strong. Let's pray. Father, oh, the danger of that, I think we can all relate to it, but I think we all still easily tend to forget. God, remind us of our reliance upon Jesus Christ. It is in his power and his power alone that we can overcome sin. And so God, those sins that we have seemingly conquered in the past, I just praise you for that. Thank you for the release of those things. But God, help us to not ever assume that that means the, the battle will never spring up again. The danger is always there, so help us rely on you and help us to stay vigilant, taking on the full armor that you provide for us to stand strong against our enemy and to stand strong against sin that so easily entangles and wants to pull us back into bondage. Keep us free of that. I pray, dear Jesus, please, in your name, amen.